Interpretation plus identification plus repetition equals strong emotion. Interpretation is what takes place when we intake information of any sort. And if they would have explained to us the scientific process of intaking information, maybe we wouldn't have spent our entire lives trying to figure out how to stop getting mad or how to stop having emotional reactions to things as they happen. Because it just so happens to be that you are wired to be an emotional being. You are designed that way. But while you are ignorant to what your emotions are and what you should do with them when they rise up, You can't help but misuse them and point them in the wrong direction. Information enters at the base of our brain and travels through the lymphatic system where your emotions are triggered on the way to the frontal lobe of your brain where rational thinking is. So before you even have a rational definition based on past present experiences, you have an emotional reaction to everything you intake. Not because you're an emotional being, not because you're a woman, but because it's by design. People throw out the cliche all the time. People fear what they don't understand. What they don't understand, they can't have a definition for. So they're left with only their emotional state in reference to what it is that they don't have any reference for. Between their projections, their interpretations of events and things said by this person and As the ego begins to define what everything they said means and the ego gives motive to why it was said as if it could ever possibly know. Because not only is the ego not present inside of the other person to be aware of the motives and interests of the other person, the ego doesn't even really exist. It's not even really inside of you. It's a fabricated creation of your unmanaged imagination. When you think of your ego from here on out, I want you to think of your ego as being exactly who you think the people that you don't like are. If you take all of your calculations, all of your interpretations of what another person has done that you disliked, you will have found everything that your ego is responsible for doing as you blindly navigate through life in the field of fantasy. Interpretation explains how you can say one thing and somebody spit it back to you as they understood it and you hear no resemblance of anything you said. Now, for no other reason than besides you think you're more important than you are, you get upset because somebody has taken your words and misunderstood them and mangled them into a presentation that is no longer suitable for the way that you want to be seen. So rather than count it off as their poor comprehension, rather than count it off as their emotional ears, you dive into it and feel attacked, thinking that value has been taken away from what you said because there's been a misunderstanding. I think that the misunderstanding is in what communication is. It is my job solely to get my point across. It is my job to speak and communicate clearly if I want to be understood. It is the listener's job to be receptive, to be open, to be active listening, to digest what is being said. That part of the communication, that part of the conversation is not on me at all. It is my job to operate always in love. It is my job to be respectful and treat everyone right. But it is not my job to comprehend the things that I am communicating to others. I can't do that. And if I try to, I'm going to end up mad. And then you're going to be mad because you're going to feel attacked by me feeling attacked and attacking you. And it's just going to be an endless cycle of confusion. But we live in a world that promotes social terrorists as if it's normal. So when people encounter people who don't fight to correct the mis interpretation of what was presented once it's been effectively communicated and there's become an awareness that there's not a disconnect in the words. There's more so an emotional barrier or a personal issue that's in the way that's blocking the message from being received. Once the, once 
someone has grown wise enough to see that pull back and not fight with something that's impossible to defeat because while you're working to chip away at the existence of the very thing that creates chaos in your partner and in yourself, your partner still spends way more time with his or her ego than they will ever be able to possibly spend with you. There are moments that your partner is right beside you and your partner is so entangled in the field of fantasy, running around with the ego that you can feel your partner's absence. I know some of the people around me are still looking for earthly partnerships, still looking for relationships with the opposite sex. And I'm just letting you know, as you're courting, when you identify a person is still in partnership with their ego, no matter how much you favor that person, no matter how fond of that person you've grown, you need to push the eject button immediately because that person is not even in partnership with themselves for them to be partnering with you. We run into people who we know lie to themselves and then we're blown away and flabbergasted when they lie to us. We know people who cheat and misuse and mismanage themselves and we feel like they're going to partner with us and offer us something different. They're going to overnight become the greatest manager and begin to identify the value in another. If you have not identified the value in yourself and you've been walking around with yourself day in and day out, there's no way you're going to see the value in another, another person. To see the value in another person when you don't see it in yourself is a direct indication that they're better than you and your ego has never told you that. You look at celebrities who have mastered their craft. There are men who have who sit on couches with pot bellies, who played basketball for three years in high school because they didn't make it their freshman year because they had to go home and train a little bit that are fully convinced that they could get on the basketball court and, and play in the NBA right now today. There are women whose beauty could only be described as peculiar who are fully convinced when they're looking at someone's profile on Instagram with a million followers, they're looking at the equivalent of themselves. And in a sense, they're 100% true, but they're also not being factual. There is not another human being who is more capable than you. There is not another human being who is more beautiful than you. There is not a human being out here who is more equipped and more suitable for your purpose and your task. But you can't do what everybody do. That's not going to be our definition of equality. Our definition of equality is based in the fact that all of us are originated from the same source and we were all given the same amount all now how you work that how you manage that what you made of that is fully up to you and that's where e equality is completely out the door fairness is no longer a part of the conversation you looking at wealthy people talking about oh they had an inheritance they had it easy whatever you have a rich father too i'm sorry that i'm not sorry that you, the person that your mother chose to procreate with and provide you an earth suit with was a bum. But that still does not change the conversation that your origin is just as fair as Donald Trump's origin. I'm sorry that I'm not one of those people who believes that Donald Trump is like a demon or some type of antichrist or something like that. But I mean, when religion went out the door, all of the spooky stuff went out the door too. What's crazy is it be the controlling people who are the Donald Trumps inside of their inner circles who dislike Donald Trump because they don't really dislike him. They're just jealous that as a leader, he gets to do things that they know that they could never do. The conversation about white privilege should really be labeled black jealousy because you know we've had that conversation before, not necessarily in the context of race, but we are always seemingly disturbed when people do things that we say we'd never do to anybody. We never want to do that. But when somebody else does it to us, we all of a sudden become vindictive and become jealous at the fact that they began to operate outside of a value system that is unique to us. I know most of us have had conversations with people who speak other languages as their primary language, other than English, of course. And inside of those conversations, we were left up to our interpretation of what it was that we thought was being said based on a bunch of context clues, a little pointing, some eye contact, some facial expressions, 
And from that, we were able to pretend as if we had full awareness of what was being said when we probably only had a slight idea based on an accent or based on a dialect that's not familiar to our ear. You. Y-O-U. You are your own universe. So being that every human being is their own universe, every time you encounter another person, even if they speak the same language as you, they are speaking a version of it that is completely foreign to your ear. And you are left up to your interpretations, which is why it's better to ask questions than to assume because you're talking to someone you never talked to before. They're saying something you never heard before. Why would you run that through your past recollection of statements to get an understanding of what it is that they're saying? What if they're trying to give you new information? Now the question becomes, are you a student? Or are you someone who operates from the place of their belief system? And even when they encounter facts, even when they encounter hard knowledge, irrefutable knowledge, they find a way to wiggle around it out of a commitment to a lower system that's not based in fact at all, but is actually built in the world of fantasy. In the scripture, when I became a man, I put away childish things. It's not speaking about hot wheels and baby dolls. Um, we played a lot of social games growing up. All of the physical games that we played were based in the social games that we were programmed to play before we were even aware that we were learning. And most of the games that we play are based in the fundamental game that we learned to play, which is called pretend. We love the game of pretend. We pretend like we're okay. We pretend like we're not bothered. We pretend like we're doing better than we are. We pretend like we're content where we are. We pretend like things are what we would like them to be, even when we can clearly see that they're not. We love the game of pretend. Pretend keeps us comfortable or it keeps us under the illusion that we're comfortable. Without the game of pretend, there would be no procrastination. Because in awareness of truth and in awareness of reality, I understand that the wheel never stops moving. So I won't be under the impression that I have more time. Time doesn't really exist, but I do. And my body really exists. And I understand that my body is a temporary vessel. And I do not know the expiration date of my temporary vessel. And I know that I will always exist, but I will not always exist in this form. And there are some things that I cannot perform outside of this form. So since I am committed to my purpose and my destiny while I am in this form, I will not procrastinate, mismanage this form and try to pleasure and please this form in temporal ways and get to the end of my journey and realize that all the time that I had to produce the kingdom that would have risen from my imagination, I spent trying to serve and please a temporary vessel that was never satisfied. All truths relate to one another and support one another. And on the flip side of that coin, all illusions support other illusions. The illusion of time supports the illusion of the ego and vice versa. The illusion of the ego supports the illusion of time. If you but pause for a moment and assess some of the time that you spend, you would notice that there are a lot of times when you think that you're really busy, that you're absolutely doing nothing at all besides in your head mapping out what you're going to do. And you feel real accomplished about that. You feel like you've done something really responsible, really adultish. But what you've truly done is squander your present moment in the anticipation of a moment that's only existent in your imagination. And when that moment arrives, it will not live up to your imaginary moment because your imaginary moment was built in the field of fantasy where things are whatever you want them to be. And a lot of people have jumped on Neville Goddard uh, trying to manipulate truth. They're going and listening to the formulas and processes and how to attract what it is that they desire. But if you're really listening to Neville Goddard's message or anyone who is partnered with truth and is expressing truth in an accurate way, if you're listening to the message of what they're really saying is you're going to attract whatever you are. So whatever it is that you're looking for, you first must 
Operate and feel as if you're already that. Ain't no manipulating that. Ain't no manipulating that. Because you can pretend like you feel how you must feel to attract what it is that you want. But if you're still not attracting it, then the truth of the matter is you're lying to yourself and you're only projecting and performing for others. We got to stop the endless search for excuses. We got to stop looking for alternative reasons for why it is that we aren't where we want to be when there's only one reason. You can't move from where you are feeling how you feel where you are. You can pout about it all you want to. You can hope that it be different all you want to. You can label it, define it as unfair and as unkind as you like, but it's not going to change the fact that it is. This is the design. And the quicker you stop wrestling with it and stop trying to steal and con your way in like you did everything else in life, things will smooth out and you'll begin to experience a lot more peace than you've ever even imagined. I'm after what you should be after as well, a peace that surpasses all understanding. The peace that you can understand isn't the true definition of peace, and it's not what we're promised. If you can imagine it, it's short of the peace that was gifted to us as an inheritance. The peace that you can understand is probably more so a picture of control. The peace that you can understand probably gives you a version of life that allows for you to predict and project everything that's going to come before you before it happens so that you can be ready for it. When the truth of the matter is, the only part of life that you can be ready for is the fact that whatever comes before you, you are greater than. Whatever obstacle arises, you're more than an overcomer. And that is what it is to be ready. You can't know what's coming next in a life that is unpredictable. That's why you worked so hard to build a life that you can predict. That's why you went and got a job so you wouldn't have to worry about where the money would come from to sustain your family as if you were the sustainer of your family. That's why you sit up and worry about how things are going to get paid because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Because you are here on your own, right? But we don't, we don't take the time to admit or we fail to realize these inconsistencies in our presentation. We claim to have a father who never leaves nor forsakes us and provides for us freely from an abundant float from the inside. And yet we spend so much time scribing and trying to solve illegible equations on whiteboards in our imagination. Interpretation is the foundation of all understanding. No matter how good something that is being said is as it comes in, it's what you make of it and what you define it as that determines the value of the statement to you. Not determines the value of the statement. The statement that was said has value or does not have value. But what you make of it, somebody could say something completely valueless. Somebody can say something worthless. Somebody could label you worthless. And you can go in and partner with that person's voice and create such a value around that person's opinion that you begin to partner with the idea that you're worthless. Not because it was a good idea, not because it was a valuable idea to partner with, but because you made it valuable. You don't understand that everything that has power in your life, you gave it power. Anything that does not have power in your life is because you totally disregard it or you have already recognized and acknowledged the fact that it's something that does not have the power to harm you or take from you. And if you would only extend that view past the innocent, lowly things like kids and grasshoppers and ants, if you would take that and extend that to even your deepest fears, because there's no such thing as as being hurt or harmed by another. I have the ability to cause harm to myself. And if I'm going to fear anybody harming me, it should probably be the only person who's ever harmed me in the past. That's hard for people like myself who experienced personal sexual trauma in the past is it was tough for me to get to a place where I could realize that it was my addiction to pornography and my desire to keep up with my older brothers that led me into the experience of 
the sexual abuse from my cousin. You can't get caught up in the branches or the sap oozing out of the tree trunk. You got to be able to dive deep down and see what the roots of, of the issue are. You have to be able to see where it all began. And the truth is, is if it's in your garden, if it's in your mind, it was planted there by you. Doesn't matter who handed you the pack of seeds. Doesn't matter who offered it to you. You are the one who took it into your garden and buried it deep down and watered it with your attention and gave it space to grow inside of your garden that you were given to keep in the tent. So no one else could possibly be to blame. But because we have such an appetite for chaos and such an appetite for conflict based on our familiarity with both of them, when people offer us trips into those familiar fields, we typically act as if we have no choice but to go. How many times have people said something disrespectful to you and you felt like you had to say something disrespectful back or you had to defend yourself because to not defend yourself would have meant X, Y, and Z. It would have meant the definition of you being altered from what you believe to be true to a definition of you that you're not even comfortable with. And who decided that? Did you go over and take a census with the people standing on the sideline and watching the interaction and see how they would feel about you or see how they thought they would feel about you after the situation took place in a different way? Or did all of that originate from the fears that originate from the father of all of your lies and all of your fears and all of your illusions, the ego? And who created that version of yourself that told you that lie other than you? This is why it's super important that you heal. This is why it's important that you have no hidden hatred. This is why it's important that you understand the significance of certain truths, like it is impossible to love anyone if you hold hatred or resentment for anyone. You think you can love your kids and you hate their daddy or love their kids and hate their mama, and that's not possible. The hatred in you will toxify your entire body, causing you to be sick with fear. And fear and love are just like light and darkness. They can't operate simultaneously inside of the same vessel or structure. When you see somebody in a certain light, you interpret everything they say through the lens of the way you see them. So it's important to see everybody the same way you'd like to be seen, I would hope, as the truth of yourself, a child, a creation, an extension of God, source, all. So starting with that basis, I can begin to interpret what is being said with a sense of familiarity, knowing that this is another being that originated the same as I did, and they are a reflection of me, just as I am a re reflection of them. And if we were not the same it would be physically impossible for us to be attracted in front of one another and included in one another's story i can listen without assuming that they're saying something that i would never say i can listen without assuming that they are hiding their true statement behind false words unless i am willing to admit and acknowledge that that is what i am doing when i'm talking if that's not what I'm doing when I'm talking, then that's not what people are doing when they're talking to me. What creates the highest level of suspicion in a human being is the inconsistency and dishonesty of their own presentation. When I know how bad I can get, I begin to anticipate the negativity of others. If I know I'll up and leave in a minute, I never am convinced that you'll stay. Regardless of what you say, not because there's not truth to what you're saying or what you're saying can't be found present in your actions, but what you're saying is something that I can't fathom for myself. It's not that the people that you call liars are not liars, but they're not liars because they lied to you. They first had to lie to themselves and convince themselves that it was true before they ever bring their presentation outside and exposed it to another external. That's why you shouldn't feel disrespected when somebody lied to you. You should feel compassion that somebody is still lying to themselves because you should remember the inability of being in that state. I still feel like 
we got more to talk about with it when it comes to interpretation. Interpretation plus identification plus repetition equals strong emotion, positive or negative. We know that we know now that that's the equation. We kind of grazed over interpretation, which sent us down a couple rabbit holes, but it's cool because they were interpretation rabbit holes, kind of. But we'll continue the conversation on interpretation, and then we'll move into identification and then repetition as we expose one of the worst forms of math that we're best at. <laughs> Lock in.